All right, everyone, we're going to get started in just a moment. Thank you for joining us. We see that we have participants who are joining. So we're just going to give it one more second till everyone's here. All right, great. Hi, everyone. Audra Burns, Dartmouth Hitchcock, Media Relations Manager. Thank you so much for joining us. I just want to do a quick intro on who the panelists you'll be hearing from today. We have Dr. Joanne Conroy. She is CEO and President of Dartmouth Hitchcock and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. We have Dr. Michael Calderwood. He is our Chief Quality Officer at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Dr. Ed Marins, who is our Chief Clinical Officer at Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. Susan Reeves, who is our Executive Vice President for Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health's Chief Nursing Officer, and Tom Mannion, who is the CEO of New London Hospital. I want to let you know that we are recording this, so we will be sending you afterwards for the recording. And we're going to begin with uh, some brief comments from our panelists. We will have an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end. I ask that you please use the Q&A function to put in your name, your media outlet, and who you would like to direct your question to. And I will then, at the end, when we open up for questions, I will be calling on you individually for your question. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Conroy. Thank you, Audra. And thank you all representatives of the media for joining us today. We are here today to speak to you about the real depth of this current pandemic surge and what it means for our hospitals, our patients, and our communities. New Hampshire holds two unfortunate honors. We have the highest seven-day rate of new COVID-19 cases per capita in the entire country. We are the least vaccinated state in New England that means we have the lowest population that's fully vaccinated in our region. As the largest healthcare system in New Hampshire, we take our position in public health very seriously and have recognized the importance to educate the public on the facts and the science of COVID-19 since its beginning. It is frustrating that we find that the evidence and our pleas are being ignored and now in the midst of a surge of COVID-19 cases that is stressing our industry and our individual facilities. Our doctors, our nurses, and the many other healthcare workers who provide critical support in our hospitals, who have been the frontline heroes of the pandemic, are leaving the workforce in multitudes, in large part out of frustration that these surges of COVID-19 infections were and are preventable. Our colleagues, your friends, your neighbors, your family members are frustrated and overwhelmed to the point of exhaustion. Despite the best evidence that vaccines and boosters have been shown to reduce the severity of illness, hospitalizations, and deaths from COVID-19, too many people are still refusing to get the vaccine, and they spread information about it. And that needs to stop today. People who could have avoided hospitalization are occupying beds and taking resources that are needed by other critically ill patients, and all because they or somebody close to them refuse to be vaccinated. As re representatives of the media, we need your help. The most immediate relief we need now is for everyone who is eligible to get vaccinated and boosted. People also need to continue with safety precautions like masking, physical distancing, and hand washing, which we've been advocating since the beginning of the pandemic. This is truly one way that each of us can help relieve the strain on our overworked healthcare system, not just at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health, but everywhere. We need to think far less about politics and personal agendas and think far more about our choices that consider our responsibilities and as members of our community, the needs of our society, and the needs of our families. 140 people died of COVID-19 related illnesses in New Hampshire in the month of November. That's 140 empty chairs at holiday tables. The time is now. The time is now for everyone to get vaccinated and boosted. Think about that, 140 people in our small, rural, and wonderful state. And it may only get worse over the next um, group of holidays. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Michael Calderwood, 
in, who's our infectious disease lead and DHMC chief quality officer. Michael. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, listening in today. We have been, since the beginning, really sharing data as it evolves. And we are today in the worst state that we have been at any point since the beginning of the pandemic. It's really discouraging, disappointing, in that we actually have the tools that are needed to fight this pandemic. And yet, at least over the last month or so, we appear to be losing. If you look at the trends that we're seeing, you can see the number of cases per day, the number of tests that are returning positive, the number of hospitalizations and the number of deaths, all returning to high levels, both where we were before vaccines and in many cases, high above that. Across the state of New Hampshire, every community is at a point of substantial community transmission. If you actually look at the numbers, we are 10 times higher than where we draw that line. If you look at hospitalizations across the state, we are 50% higher than we were at the worst point at the end of December of 2020, and we are continuing to rise. And that means these are hospital beds that we do not have available for all of the other healthcare needs across our state and the region. At present, we know that 42% of all of our ICU beds are actually being used to care for COVID-19 patients. And 15% of all patients hospitalized across the state are accounted for by this one disease. We are seeing areas as people come in to be tested where we have testing positive rates that are reaching 25%. That means one out of every four people coming in to be tested is testing positive. And as that rate goes up, we actually know that we are missing cases in the community. And there are some that estimate when you get to 25%, that may be that the true number of daily infections is seven times higher than what's getting reported and what we're actually capturing. And so this is out there, this is around us. Now we know that as we've had more people vaccinated, there were periods where we actually got to much less transmission. And so people were beginning to move around, to travel, to wear masks in fewer settings. We are at a point where we need to begin to return to some of those practices. We need to think about our mask use in the community because there are going to be more people around who are carrying COVID-19, may not know it, maybe in the early stages, but can transmit to you unwillingly and unknowingly, and then you can bring this back to your family. Now, we do know that those who are vaccinated actually have a much lower risk of getting a severe illness, ending up in the hospital, ending up in the ICU or dying. And we're actually getting some encouraging data that amongst those who are vaccinated and boosted, they may also have good protection against severe illness, even from the newest variants that are coming out. But it requires that we get more people vaccinated. As was mentioned across the state, we achieve 65% of our population uh, that have received a vaccine. We are seeing increasing numbers come forward for boosters. We're beginning to vaccinate. Uh, young children, particularly in ages all the way down uh, to elementary school. And this is making a difference, but it still is 35% who are really needing to understand their role in helping to end this pandemic. And so we ask those who have not been vaccinated to really ask the questions and make sure that we are providing the data that you need, but it is critical that you step forward and you get vaccinated. As we look around our hospital, our beds are mostly filled with individuals who've not received the vaccine. Yes, we see some breakthrough infections, but I will tell you, personally having seen these patients, we have individuals who have breakthrough infections and despite having a lot of other illness and having an immune system that can't fight off some of the illness, Having been vaccinated, having been boosted, 
These are individuals who are asking when they can go home, requiring very minimal amounts of care, as opposed to those who are not vaccinated and are critically ill and dying. And you see it every day, the impact of these vaccines and the impacts choices that people are making. So I'm going to end um, there. I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Ed Mirrens. And uh, Dr. Mirrens is the DHH Chief Clinical Officer. Ed. Thanks, Michael. I want to emphasize that COVID-19 doesn't really care who you are, what political party you belong to, where you get your news, and where your social media is. It, it, if it's an equal opportunity uh, virus, and we've seen that impact in the past year and a half. You know, we've seen the biggest impact early on before we had vaccines in our older and more compromised individuals in our community. And as Dr. Calderwood said, those people got vaccinated. And now in this current uh, surge, we are not seeing the same impact we saw at skilled nursing facilities or places where people with uh, compromised immune systems uh, uh, live or where they seek their care. In fact, those people are doing better. And, and when they do present for care, it's a milder disease. I think we're impressed with the pace of development of vaccines and boosters and modifications that will allow us to see the end of this pandemic and view it as being done at a rapid pace. But I think we have to understand that the development of mRNA vaccines and some of the other technology has been in the works for well over two decades. This is not new but this is science and we're asking people to really believe uh, in, in the power of this, understand the science and transcend whatever other beliefs you might have. Vaccination works. And we, we feel very strongly about that as being the tool to allow us to get beyond this. I think there are a lot of people that still think this is just for people that are older or have other problems that if you're young and you eat well and you take vitamins, you'll be fine. But you know, nearly 20% of the patients that we are seeing in the hospital are younger than 40. And you're 14 times more likely to die if you've not been vaccinated. Uh, it's really Im important for you to understand this. That's the personal part of it. The bigger impact is, is what is happening across the state and across our system. We are seeing emergency rooms now full of COVID patients. Often there are people that are critically ill. Um, there are patients that are requiring ventilation and are being intubated in emergency departments while they wait for beds at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and other places. Um, hospitals in Boston are shipping patients to the south. Um, our hospitals in the region and across the state have been significantly impacted, have stopped doing elective cases, cases that are not kind of can do them sometime, but need to be done in a short period of time, what we can no longer do because we don't have beds or the capabilities in the hospital because our beds are full of COVID patients. This is really important and is having a big impact on the regular care uh, of patients in the region. Often patients are waiting to transport to Dartmouth-Hitchcock and other hospitals in our system that need non-COVID care, but beds are not available. Critical care beds are not available. An OR is not available. It's having a huge impact. Um, the other thing that, that is being impacted are the people that provide the care. This is having a huge physical and emotional toll on our staff, from our custodial staff, through our nursing staff, our surgeons, and leadership. This is a preventable crisis. This is something that we can all do and can be prevented. And I think the frustration with the direct caregivers is not the, not the care that they provide the medicines that they give or the hands that they hold. It's that the people that are dying in their midst, being intubated, and the families that are left with a loved one not with them is all preventable. And we want to be able to use our resources to be able to take care of them. The part now, and we have immersed ourselves in science and research and providing the absolute best care that we can, is for you to do your part and for people to get vaccinated, to get boosted if you're beyond six months, and to get your kids vaccinated. By doing so, we can overcome this. We can move beyond. We can move into doing the care that we want to provide, the elective care, and be able to have timely and important access across the system and across our partners across the state for your healthcare needs. I want to turn it over now to, to Sue Reeves, our Executive Vice President for DHMC. Sue? Thank you, Ed, and good afternoon, everyone. 
We've been watching now for about 22 months the COVID activity in our twin state region, and particularly the hospitalization rates in New Hampshire and Vermont. And all through the pandemic, we have been modifying our visitor policies in the interest of keeping our patients and importantly, our staff safe. Recently, we've made some further adjustments just prior to Thanksgiving because of the increasing in, uh, pandemic activity in the region. And based on what we're seeing, we believe we're going to have to make further modifications in the days ahead. We know how difficult this is. It's a last resort for us, but our highest priority continues to be keeping our patients and our staff safe. Any changes that we make in our visitor policy will be based on that priority. And I would encourage anybody who wants to see the most current visitor policies for Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health Organizations to please visit our dhmc.org website. One of the changes we'll also be making is to no longer accept cloth masks, homemade masks in individuals who are entering the medical center or another one of our hospitals in the system. And everybody entering will be provided with a fresh, sterile medical mask. And this is again, to continue to prevent transmission of the virus. Our COVID-19 operations group has been active for better than a year now. This is a group of experts within the medical center who come together to make the plans for how, we, how will we respond to increasing activity in the medical center. Working with clinical leaders, they're now making plans for how to expand our inpatient critical care availability as well as other inpatient bed capacity. These changes we're planning absolutely have the um, ability to impact operations in other parts of the medical center. We're being very careful in this planning to make sure that we are limiting as much as we can the disruption to our patients, our family members, and our staff. Talk about um, uh, one of the real challenges we're having. We've been having trouble with transfers of patients. Our goal at the Academic Medical Center, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, has been to make sure that we are available for the most acutely ill and injured in our region. In order to do that, we often have to transfer patients around our system and around our region and increasingly around and outside of our state to make sure that capability exists. We're working closely with our Academic Medical Center colleagues throughout New England as we do this every day. Uh, there's expert and uh, very efficient communication that allows this to happen. And again, trying to make sure always that we're available to take high acuity transfers from our other regional small hospitals as we have the capability to do so. On the prevention front, one of the things we're really working to do internally here at the medical center is to increase the availability of the booster vaccines in order to get our staff boosted as quickly as possible, again, um, to make sure that we're protecting our staff in the way that we can, and also to make sure that we have the availability of our rest, uh, rapid testing capabilities. Finally, I've been asked to share just a couple of comments that I've been hearing in my conversations with our nurses throughout our health system, an amazing group of individuals who has really been on the front line of this pandemic now for almost two years. They would say, yes, they are tired. And like everyone else, the last 22 months have taken an incredible uh, toll on their physical and emotional stamina. They tell me that one of their greatest sadnesses is, have, has been the number of desperately ill patients that they've cared for, uh, for whom the entire experience could have been avoided through vaccination. And finally, they also tell me that while they feel it's a little overwhelming right now, again, they're still looking ahead to the time when they can more fully care for the needs of our region, the people of our region. They're tough, and fortunately for all of us, they remain committed to doing the good work that they do every day. And with that, I'll turn to my colleague from New London, Tom Mannion. Thank you, Sue. I'm Tom Mannion. I'm the president and CEO of New London Hospital, uh, which is an affiliate of Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. Uh, New London is a 25 bed critical access hospital, and we serve the uh, rural communities of the Sunapee and Kearsarge region in New Hampshire. Uh, critical access hospitals by nature are very rural, but we make up about one in every four acute care hospitals in the United States. 
And we serve as a critical safety net for those rural communities uh, to make sure that they can receive the care that they need. While we grappled with COVID for the better part of two years now, what we're facing today is the worst it's ever been for the London Hospital. Uh, to just share a few examples, I'll, I'll just hit on a few, a few highlights that were already alluded to by my colleagues, but I think are worth mentioning uh, how they're relevant to us. Our workforce, the staffing shortages that we're facing right now, not just in nursing and other clinical areas, but in all departments uh, is, is severe. It's very severe. And that makes the burden even heavier for the staff that we do have who are committed to serve our communities. But with this recent surge, is taking an extreme toll on the burnout that they're all, they're all working through. Many of our employees are also parents who struggle with things like childcare. Uh, as a parent myself, I have three kids who are under six. It's been very challenging throughout these last two years to make sure that we're available, doing the right things, getting kids tested and making sure that everyone is safe. But this is even worse now with the COVID outbreak and surges that we are seeing, trying to support staff and trying to make sure that, that they're doing what they need to do to take care of their families. Our vaccination rates, while the town of New London actually is doing quite well, we have about three quarters of our population who are fully vaccinated. It doesn't take too far to go outside of our, our little bubble in New London to find some other communities that are greatly suffering. And I would point uh, probably the closest to our Newport Health Center uh, in Sullivan County, where uh, we are dealing with a tremendous influx of, of COVID patients who are sick, who are ill, uh, and are indeed suffering and not getting access to the care that they would need otherwise. Overall, uh, the, the recent surge is diverting our efforts from providing the attention to the initiatives we wanna be focusing on for our patients. We know our community relies on our services and COVID-19 is challenging our ability to move forward. We're playing defense on a regular basis, but we are committed to providing exceptional care uh, and serving in that critical support net uh, capacity for, for all of our patients in our communities. We need your help now more than ever. And with that, I will pause and open it up to your questions. Um, as a reminder for our media participants, if you would like to ask a question, if you could please put your name and your media outlet in the Q&A and who you would like to direct your question to, and I will call upon you one at a time. We will begin with Anne-Marie Timmons from the New Hampshire Bulletin. Anne-Marie, please ask your first question to Dr. Calderwood. Thank you. I am um, interested in hearing if the 42% if the of patients you mentioned that are in our ICUs is a statewide percentage, and then of that population, how many are unvaccinated versus vaccinated? Thank you very much for that question. We actually have been uh, tracking this very closely since the beginning of the pandemic. And so all of the hospitals, both in New Hampshire and actually across the United States, have been submitting their data. And so you actually can track on a daily basis the um, hospital, hospital utilization in terms of inpatient beds, ICU beds, and understand where there are hotspots. So the 42% is actually uh, reported to us from the federal government as where we stand right now across the entire state of New Hampshire. It is reflected uh, locally across our system as well. If you look at those who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated, um, we are seeing in our most ill patients, those in the ICU, um, that it's about 85% or higher who are unvaccinated. Um, as we go into some of our more general care spaces, um, it is about 75% who are unvaccinated. Next, we have Adam Sullivan from WCAX, and he has a question for Dr. Marins and Dr. Conroy. Adam? Sorry, can you hear me all right? Sorry about that. Technology. I can hear you, Adam. Uh, um, you know, you mentioned New Hampshire being the, the, the least, the lowest vaccination rate or state in New England. However, Vermont is the most vaccinated state in New England, arguably in the country, and they're they're seeing a surge as well, uh, Dr. Marin. So I'm wondering what you attribute that to. And Dr. Conroy, I'll just follow up with you. Um, what's the worst case scenario? And does worst case scenario include um, the reopening of um, state facilitated surge centers? So Dr. Marin's vaccinations first, please. Well, I, I, I might have Dr. Calderwood answer this from a from a vaccination standpoint. You know, I think that 
what we're what we're looking at is a, a state that two states did lock. Vermont did an incredible job at a lockdown, but a big pr- proportion of the population is children. Uh, vir- this population had not experienced. Uh, the the virus in the same way that other states in the southern United States did, where many many people got the virus, and the and the healthcare systems were completely overwhelmed. Uh, a year ago, uh, and even even more uh, more recent times, hospitals in Texas, Florida, and southern parts of the United States were completely overwhelmed. We never experienced that up here, but but there's still a, a you know 25 percent of the population being children didn't 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 experience it as much. Now, there are positive cases. If you look at the total numbers in Vermont, they're not a lot, but we are certainly experiencing a surge. Our challenge is that the resources that we have in this geographically dispersed population in northern New England for health care, for intensive care unit, is much smaller than in the big population centers in the South. And that's the big issue. We have a resource issue. We have a staffing issue. And, uh, you know, there could be, you know, we've, we've had ongoing meetings with representatives from the state around FEMA resources. They may be providing us some paramedic resources to help out. Uh, but we have not gotten to the point of looking at uh, standing up a, a standalone facility. Uh, d- before I pivot to Dr. Cumberland, Dr. Caldwell, any anything else you'd add about the unique situation with Vermont and where it is now? Well, I think what we are seeing in Vermont is while they're having a surge, it is uh, definitely not to the same level that is being experienced in New Hampshire. And um, you can see that in the lower case numbers, obviously they have a lower population, but as well as their percent hospitalizations uh, for their available beds, it is lower in Vermont than in New Hampshire. And that reflects their higher rate of vaccination. I think since the beginning, we've been asked this question, how many people need to be vaccinated? And early on, as we were looking at the initial strains of the virus, we were saying, well, we at least need to be over 70%. And we're not even there. I mean, we're, we're, we're at 65%. So we have not hit that initial line in the sand that we drew. Now, as we get each new variant, we've begun to argue, you actually need to be higher than that. Do you need to be 80? Do you need to be 90? So, well, I want to applaud those that have come forward, gotten vaccinated, been boosted to get us to 65%. We have a long way to go. And we know from, um, you know, we can look across Europe where you look at vaccination rates by country. You really don't see the death toll from this virus begin to decline until your vaccination rate in the country um, gets above 75%. And so we're not there uh, as a state. I think the other thing we have to be aware of is that um, really those that are most vaccinated are those who are older, those who are kind of older than, than 60. But we see the rate of those who are vaccinated dropping as you go down to those in younger age groups. And those are the ones who are out and being social. And so you're going to have a lot more transmission. And so we have to make sure that we are vaccinating everyone, not just, we had to upfront, make sure we were protecting those most vulnerable. But as we think of the role of vaccination in de- decreasing transmission, it really is going to rely on those at a younger age coming forward as well. And Adam, your question about uh, the freestanding sites, you know, every region is a little bit different. Dartmouth-Hitchcock has a seven-stage surge plan. We're about halfway through that. But we are prepared to convert every single space in the institution to care for critically ill patients if needed. There are some complexities with freestanding centers in terms of pharmacy, high-flow oxygen capability, and last but not least, staffing which is the biggest issue for almost every single facility in the state. Thank you. Our next question is from Anne-Marie Timmons from New Hampshire Bulletin for Dr. Marins. Anne-Marie. Thank you. I was also having some tech difficulties there. Um, Dr. Marins, you had talked about messaging and just getting people to to you know, vaccinate, continue to vaccinate. That message has been um, reiterated by healthcare folks for a long time. Uh, the governor says it every week. Dr. Chan says it every week. Um, do we need to pivot? Are there are there new messages at this point? Are there better messengers at this point? 
Uh, Emory, thanks for the question. I think we can all be messengers, and I think people need to hear it in a number of different ways. They need to hear it from family members that watch the news. They need to hear it from people in the clergy, healthcare providers, the people they work with. I think people need to hear it in a number of different ways. And what we're learning every time, you know, as we begin to think about what is the what is the impact of a of a new strain, we keep coming back to one of the the biggest protectant you can do is get vaccinated. And we know we'll see reformulations of the vaccine to meet the different uh, differences that we see as we see genetic shift in the, in, in, with viral mutations. But the vaccine continues to be the best protection we can afford ourselves, our family, our community, and ultimately, ultimately the state. So I think what, we, what people don't see is what a number of us see. We see young people, uh, uh, you know, on ventilators in an intensive care unit three weeks into admission. Here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, we have ECMO units, which is heart-lung bypass. And at any given time, we have one to two patients on heart-lung bypass machines for COVID. That's what people don't see. And I think what we want to be able to communicate is that we don't, we do not need to be taking care of those patients if they were vaccinated. And we want people to see this is not a political issue. It's, it, it is not an issue, anything other than an important public health issue. And we need to communicate it in that way. We need to meet, move beyond uh, people's fears uh, or, or people's misinformation. And we're trying to convey information in a way that's very based on science and the reality of care. Robert from the Caledonian Record. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I was checking to see Dr. Kohler, would, uh, if I heard you correctly, it would be about 75% would be roughly the ideal rate minimum. Well, you know, I think when we look at uh, kind of the history of vaccines in general, we actually aim to get over 90% vaccinated where we are seeing at least with the Delta variant that you see a um, change in the death rates by country, mm -hmm. you have to at least be above 75%. Now, is that going to be true as we look at some of these newer variants? No, I think we're gonna probably need to be higher than that. Um, but I know is that the 65% that we achieved, and if you look at the plateau in uh, people coming forward for first doses, we really haven't seen much change since the summer. We have a lot of people coming forward um, uh, for boosters. We have a lot of children coming forward, but in terms of adults, there is a lot of uh, movement that we still need to see. I see. And then um, my last question here, in terms of the North country, uh, looking at vaccination rates uh, and uh, a capacity burdens on hospitals. How does that compare to other regions of the state? Is it better? Is it worse? Is it the same? It's actually been interesting. If you look at uh, county to county comparisons, um, you'll see, you know, a few percentage difference points across uh, each of the counties. Uh, but really, the rates of vaccination have been fairly consistent. Um, you will see areas where you have um, higher population centers and um, less mask use in the community mm -hmm. as where you're beginning to see um, large increases. So we are seeing more of that in the south of the state that is reflected by higher PCR positivity rates uh, in the south of the state. But really, you know, we are, we don't draw lines by county. We don't even draw lines by state. Uh, we are all in this together uh, and we all have a role to play. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Karen Danderant at the Seacoast Media Group. And this one will be for Sue Reeves and Tom Mannion. Okay, good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Fabulous. So I'm, one of my primary jobs for the paper that I work for is the chief health writer. So as you can imagine, COVID-19 is my new second job. Um, I'm doing a story currently about the situation with beds and staffing. And I know, for instance, I know that Wentworth Douglas is um, actually 
repurposing areas of the hospital to create a second ICU. Um, Exeter Hospital is creating beds in their decontamination unit. So I'm wondering how the situation is at Dartmouth if you're having to repurpose areas of the hospital to meet needs for COVID patients. That's my first question and I have a second one. But we'll start with that one. Okay, so why don't I start, Tom, and then turn to you. So uh, the surge plan that Dr. Conroy indicated earlier uh, has seven phases to it, and it involves, uh, if you will, um, moving, rolling into areas of the medical center that are uh, care providing areas, but may not necessarily be inpatient beds or if they are inpatient beds, be designated as critical care capacity beds. And so that's the process that we are in now, is identifying areas where we can expand, number one, our critical care capacity, and number two, expand our emergency department capacity. Both of those involve uh, expanding into areas that have other functions when we're not in this surge uh, phase. And so the answer is yes. Uh, there are, you know, there are, as you get out further and further, that's when you begin to see the more extreme plans about uh, taking over uh, a, a large auditorium or something like that. But at this point in time, again, the medical center in Lebanon is focused on the expansion of our critical care capacity because we see that as our number one priority in terms of service to the community at this point in time. Tom? Tom? And, and so for, for critical access hospitals like ours, so we do not have, at least our critical access hospital does not have an ICU. So one of the roles that we're playing in this is working with Dartmouth Hitchcock, uh, ideally keeping patients who are lower acuity, who have COVID perhaps that we can keep here and manage here and do that well um, here in, in our hospital. But also there's a lot of non-COVID issues going on right now too. People who are just sick yes. and people who have delayed care for a long time are now coming in and needing high levels of, of care um, and so part of what we're doing, working with Dartmouth Hitchcock and, and the, uh, a bunch of our affiliate colleagues is thinking through what patients can we take from Dartmouth that we can manage. It's more appropriate for us to manage so that the higher acuity patients can go to Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Um, for us, one of our big, as I mentioned, workforce is a huge issue for us. We have uh, we, we need more nurses. And so we, we do have uh, some some bed caps that we're working through. Um, and ideally, we have some more uh, nurses who will be joining us here in a few weeks that will help us open that that capacity so we can take more on from Dartmouth so that those sick patients can go to DHMC uh, and receive that level of care. So that that's really our role in our in our capacity right now. Uh, but we do not have an ICU, so we will not try to manage those level of patients here. Okay. And you may have already answered the other question I had was, are you aware, I know the governor is talking and he has a press conference at three o'clock today and it might be what he's going to announce. I know that he's been looking at adding auxiliary acute care facilities as they did like when COVID first started, they opened up like the University of New Hampshire, the gymnasium to a section of beds. So I was wondering if you are aware of any auxiliary acute care facilities underway or that you guys are planning in the future in case you need the space. Again, I, again, Dr. Conroy mentioned this. There are a lot of challenges with the offsite um, auxiliary uh facilities that can be stood up. So again, to the extent that we that it's possible, our expansion is going to be under the roof of the medical center. Uh, we have a lot of real estate that is under uh, the green roof here at Dartmouth Hitchcock. And yeah. again, our primary expansion would be internal at this point in time. Of course, we'll await uh, what Governor Sununu has to say this afternoon. Right. Well, the other question, I'm sorry. Sorry. The other question that arose out of that when I was talking to some of my other hospitals for this story is if they do these auxiliary care, who's going to staff them? You already have staffing issues. That's that's one of the significant concerns in doing it. Yeah. Thank you. Karen, another thing that we're working on that really, you know, we, we have a connected care telehealth enterprise that reaches across New York, Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire. And one of the other supports, what we know is that sometimes there are critically ill patients that are in member and regional emergency rooms for hours needing critical, uh, critical care. And we can, uh, we're working on turning on 
uh, our tele ICU platform to support critically ill patients in emergency departments when there's not a critical care bed for them to readily be able to go to. So that's leveraging some of our existing telehealth connected care resources to, to help hospitals that may not have the expertise or, or just even the staff to manage a critically ill patient. So that's leveraging resources that we have right now. and We'll continue to work on developing that. Yeah, that's wonderful. I did a story on the tele I think I think telehealth is like the way it's going to be from now on, but that's just me. Anyway, thank you that very much. Thanks, Karen. Our next uh, two questions come from Nora Doyle Burr at the Valley News for Dr. Marins. Hi, how are you? Um, thanks for taking my questions. I'm wondering sort of, I guess, bigger picture. There's been some research in terms of like excess deaths, sort of people dying of heart attacks because they can't get, get the care. I, could you be more maybe descriptive in terms of, you know, what type of care is not available sort of as you expand care for COVID patients? Or yeah, so what we, you know, as we expand care for COVID patients and beds, we are scaling back on elective admissions or, or admissions for, for surgeries or procedures that can be done in the future. This might be a patient that has a seizure disorder that we want to electively admit for a video EEG study, or it might be someone who needs a hip replacement and it can get put off. These are situations that need to be done but can be put off for sometimes for weeks while we while we manage a crisis that are happening sometimes we're dealing with patients who have elected themselves not to not to come for care or have just held off and situations have gotten worse from the beginning of the pandemic both at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and our members we have been open for routine visits routine care primary care radiology lab all those visits uh, but there has been some hesitancy by some patients to come in for care there have been delays uh, in terms of getting people in, but we've worked to get everyone in for what they've needed. But but sometimes people are presenting a, a little bit later on in the course of care or have hoped to not have to present for care. Right now, I think people are pretty comfortable seeking emergency care. Uh, the teams that they'll meet that they'll meet in our, in our hospitals are all vaccinated or wearing appropriate PPE and, and they're safe in that environment. So I think we're just dealing with uh, a lot of things that are happening. We also know there are things that have gotten worse during the crisis. We know that opioid deaths have increased. We know that mental health issues and crises have increased. And the resources that we have from that for, for, for both of those are pretty thin, but, but areas that we are really interested in and providing across Dartmouth Hitchcock Health and have actually built both of those areas into our future planning in Southern New Hampshire. Hey, Nora, this is Joanne. <laughs> Let's be clear, though, when you have over 40 percent of your beds taken up by COVID patients, those people that have a heart attack, that have a stroke, that need that ICU bed, um, we have to work really hard to find a bed to put them in. And sometimes we can't find one in the state. That's what this means for the average individual who has other health issues, is that preventable admissions to the ICU for people that are unvaccinated and have COVID-19 is straining the resources that are available to take care of those other patients. Make no mistake about that. And not to pile on, but I'll just add to you, Nora, that we have our own ambulance service here in New London, and we've yeah. traveled as far as Providence, Rhode Island, for to get a patient to the uh, place they need to get care. So our, our ambulance fleet is is moving way further than they ever have before as a part of this surge and, and this ongoing pandemic. And and how many uh, COVID inpatients do you have now? Sort of what's your census, that, that type of thing? Are you, I mean, I know you have something like 396 beds there at GHMC. So are you were, over that? Yeah. So, uh, no. So if you were talking about DHMC as of this yep. morning, uh, we had 35 individuals with COVID illness in uh, the medical center in the health system as a whole. We were at 74 this morning. And my uh, sources tell me that that number is already higher than first thing this morning. And, and the other thing, Nora, is that there are a number of people in the hospital that have been in the hospital long enough to no longer have COVID. 
but they need to be in the hospital. They've they've survived the intensive care unit. They have extensive lung injury and other problems. They're no longer infectious, so they actually fall off that list. On any given day, we may have up to 10 additional patients in the hospital that started off with COVID, but are here and occupying beds. And these COVID patients uh, stay a long period of time, weeks in the hospital. And in addition to being in the hospital, there's no place for them to go when they need to be discharged because there's no access or very limited access to skilled nursing facilities and rehab. So, Nora, of those 35 patients, however, yes. two-thirds of them are in ICU bed. Thank you, Nora. Um, our next question is coming from Nancy West from indepthnh.org, and this is for Dr. Calderwood. Thank you for having this press conference today. This is all such very important information. As I think Karen mentioned, Governor Sununu is holding a press conference at three o'clock today. What would you have him do to slow the spread of the virus? Thank you for the question. I think that there are a number of things that uh, our communities can do in helping us to combat uh, this pandemic, particularly as it's beginning to surge again. We know of a number of uh, uh, towns and cities that are beginning to um, think about what are their mask poli policies? Are they going to have masks be required in indoor spaces? We know masks are a really important part of um, preventing the transmission, particularly when you can't maintain a distance from others and when you're in an indoor environment and in large crowds. So thinking through um, those conversations is gonna be really important. We know that there are a number of um, kind of town meetings and uh, city councils that are going to be really looking at what they can do. That is one thing. The second thing is the state has uh, really been uh, focusing on how to make sure vaccines are available to all who want them. And that means setting up things like these recent blitzes that were really quick to fill up. Again, we know that they're filling up mostly with people uh, seeking a booster. And so thinking about how we create more opportunities uh, for all vaccination, including a primary series that is gonna be really important here. And then as we um, kind of think about uh, other policies, you know, it's going to be important as we think about uh, the upcoming holidays that we begin to have those conversations about um, how you can do that safely. Um, and I'm happy to kind of give some thoughts on that. But we clearly do see that in the 14 days or so after a holiday period, you see a spike in cases. And so we saw that uh, in the state of New Hampshire following this recent Thanksgiving break. Um, you tend to see a little bit of a plateauing um, after that 14 day period in between Thanksgiving and Christmas, New Year's, the end of December. And then you see another spike. What we don't actually see, and it's important for folks to realize as they're looking at the data, you know, we've heard about how sick patients are and how long they remain hospitalized. We actually don't see that same plateau or lull in hospitalizations. And so you will see a high number of hospitalized patients throughout December. And we hope like last year that as you go into early January, that may start to decline, but it's gonna be really contingent upon the decisions people are making in the month ahead. So as people are making holiday plans, there's lots of guidance around how do you get tested before you travel? How do you get tested when you return from travel? What do you do when you're uh, meeting with family in terms of uh, the numbers and the locations and the mask use? It obviously is much safer uh, the more people at your table or your gathering who are vaccinated. And so that is going to be a critical part of those conversations. And there are some that even over Thanksgiving said that they really wanted everyone to be vaccinated who was coming for dinner. And those are conversations families need to have with one another. What I will say is I always am asked, is testing an important thing? And as we see these numbers going up, we absolutely are seeing people who thought they were safe over the holidays, come back and get tested and are finding that they're positive. Thankfully, those that are vaccinated are not having very severe illness, but the fact they're getting tested allows them to know and get out of group settings where they may transmit to others. 
And so thinking about that pre-event or post-event testing, if you're in an at-risk setting, particularly if you're traveling or traveling internationally, is going to be really important as you look ahead. Do you think with this surge, we're at a place where a statewide mask mandate would make sense? You know, we have done uh, that before. I am obviously very pro uh, mask, particularly in indoor uh, environments. Um, and I am again encouraged by all of the towns and cities that are beginning to reevaluate where they are on that. Um, I think we will work with each of those towns and cities to provide the data. Um, that would be my um, kind of vote. But again, the best I can do is to continue <laughs> to advocate for that. All right, real quick, we just need to wrap up, but we would like to get one last question in from Megan Pierce at the Union Leader. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great, yeah. Hi, right, thanks for having this press conference. Um, you guys have presented a, a lot of compelling reasons why people should get vaccinated. Um, and I, I know you're trying to reach um, people who are hesitant to get the vaccine. And as a journalist, I often speak to uh, people about this. And a very a, a very common reason is people say, well, I've had it, so I don't need the vaccine. And so I'm just wondering, what what is your message to those people that say they don't need the vaccine because they've already had COVID? So why don't I start and then Michael um, follow up. We know that... Um, that long lasting immunity is, um, you should not expect that after you've been exposed or had COVID. There is no evidence that that is as strong a, a antibody response as you get from any of the vaccines. Michael? You know, that's a, it's a very accurate statement. And so we, there's actually very good data um, that uh, those that recover but are unvaccinated are at much higher risk for a second infection. And so it is recommended right now that as soon as you recover, you are eligible to be vaccinated. That's the best thing you can do to boost your immunity and to think about your protection um, from that point forward. I will also say that, you know, you may early on have been infected by a different variant. And as we see new variants that are circulating, um, particularly for those who are fully vaccinated with a booster, that protection from that vaccine series with the booster is your best protection against even the newest of variants. And we're getting good data that that boosted dose is helping. And so that is the best thing you can do as we continue to go along through this pandemic. Thank you very much, Dr. Calderwood. And thank you to all of our panelists and all of our media representatives who joined us today. Um, we will be sending this recording out later. If you have any follow-up questions, please do direct them to me, audra.burns at hitchcock.org, and we'll be in touch. Thank you, everyone.